EPS Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm Mark Blunden and this is The Leader. So who's going to be crowned the UK's 57th Prime Minister? Opposition parties are, of course, calling for a general election well before 2024. After her dramatic resignation on Thursday, following a brief stint in number 10, Liz Truss now has to eke out up to a week before her successor is anointed. As former Chancellor Rishi Sunak left his home this morning, it's being strongly suggested he could again be a leadership contender. Sunak and Penny Mordaunt are said to be in the running, but also former PM Boris Johnson. However, a Johnson move would be highly divisive for obvious reasons. Peterborough MP Paul Bristow and Reigate MP Crispin Blunt shared their opposing thoughts on BBC Breakfast. In 2019, I fought a high-profile by-election in the city, and I came third. So I didn't just lose, I lost badly. But six months later, we won that general election, and Boris was our Prime Minister. We were 19 points behind in the polls then. He brought it back. What we've got to remember is the next general election, he won't be facing Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, and he would be carrying, if he was leading us, uh, the burden of all the issues that got us into the place we were six or seven weeks ago. There's also unhappiness that Truss may receive a £115,000 a year ex-Prime Minister's payout for future public duties, but Truss would have to apply for this and we don't know yet if she will. But what we do know is it will be a weekend of wheeler dealing before nominations go in on Monday. But whoever it is, how legitimate will their government be and who can offer the stability Britain's craving? To examine the days ahead, we're joined by Evening Standard Deputy Political Editor David Bond. David, what's been the fallout from Liz Truss's resignation? Well, the fallout really is that, you know, it's almost been done and dusted, right? You know, she's resigned now quickly into this breakneck speed leadership election contest, which is going to be done potentially. We could have a new prime minister by Monday evening. So the Conservative Party has certainly listened to those critics who said the previous contest was too long. It dragged on for many more weeks than it needed to. And so now we have the complete reverse, which is that this kind of lightning fast election contest. And it's as we speak now, it's not even well, it's about 24 hours after Liz Truss announced she was resigning outside number 10. And it already feels like a distant memory. Things are moving at such speed at the minute. It's really quite hard to keep up. What does this weekend have in store for the leadership contest? A lot of political horse trading? The horse trading will begin. It's uh, it's underway now. It's been underway really from the moment um, Liz Truss appeared in front of that lectern yesterday. There are increasing number of MPs now declaring on Twitter or on uh, the radio or on the telly uh, who they're going to be supporting. Uh, Already the numbers are stacking up for Rishi Sunak, but fascinatingly, numbers also climbing for Boris Johnson as well. We'll probably see those sort of main front runners come out and declare if they're going to stand or not. And also some of the other names that have been thrown into the mix who might have been expected to stand, come out and maybe say that they're not going to run to try and clear the way so that it, it can accelerate the process. So what's the mechanics of the process now? The 1922 Backbench Committee and the Conservative Party came together yesterday and they agreed on this accelerated process whereby they would do it all by next Friday. So we will definitely have a new Prime Minister by Friday. Friday next week. But what they really want to do is try and sort this more quickly than that. They want to essentially have one candidate emerge from the process with the parliamentary party, so with the Conservative MPs. All nominations must be in by 2pm on Monday. To go forward, you need at least 100 MPs backing you, 100 Conservative MPs. uh, And then If there are three, there will be a quick vote of Conservative MPs. They will whittle that down to two. And then interestingly, this time they will have an indicative vote by the party's MPs. So it won't be binding, but it will demonstrate to the membership, who will then get the chance to vote online if it goes that far, but to demonstrate to the party's grassroots activists who the parliamentary party thinks should go forward. And that will all be sewn up by Monday evening. And Penny Mordaunt's also in the mix. Penny Morden is in the mix, yeah. She hasn't quite yet got the sort of numbers that seem to be stacking up publicly for uh, for Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson. 
But, you know, it's expected that she could grow and grow in, in strength, particularly if Boris Johnson decides, you know what, actually, there's still too much anger at the way his premiership fell apart and the anger over law breaking and rule breaking in Downing Street. That is still very raw with lots and lots of Conservative MPs, some of whom are already threatening to resign the whip if he comes back. And so one senses that with Boris Johnson's return, there will just be more division and chaos. And so there's lots of Conservative MPs who just really, really hope that he won't stand. And so at the moment, I think it's fair to say that he is building up lots of support. He still had lots and lots of allies in the Conservative Party. And of course, it's still popular with the grassroots. Where does all this leave Jeremy Hunt working away on his Halloween budget statement? He will be absolutely determined to press ahead with that, regardless of who is going to be the next Prime Minister, the next Tory leader. And the scale of the challenge for both him and whoever wins the contest was laid bare today when the public borrowing figures came out for September, showing that public borrowing had hit £20 billion, higher than OBR uh, forecast back in March, and a lot higher than last September. A lot of that is being driven by the interest which the government is having to pay, which part of which is linked to inflation, which of course is raging away. So if he needed any reminder of how quickly he needs to act to put the public finances back on a, a surer footing, this, this was certainly it. What are the polls and opposition parties saying about a general election? Presumably the Tories will want to hold off as long as possible. There was a poll out this morning. I just saw I saw it quickly and it was a map of Britain and it was basically a sea of red, according to the latest polls, which I think has Labour with a 39 point lead. I mean, take your pick of polls at the moment. They're all showing huge, huge leads for Labour. So there's no doubt that if the election was tomorrow, the Conservatives would face a, a, a devastating defeat. And so the Tories will want to avoid that at all costs. The new leader will want to avoid that at all costs. But, you know, the opposition parties, Keir Starmer was again on the airwaves this morning calling for a general election. Ed Davey, leader of the Liberal Democrats, the SNP, they're all pushing harder and harder. There is a petition as well, which has got a growing number of uh, signatures on it, which is going to push for it. But again, because of the way our system works, it is very difficult. If the future prime minister doesn't want to call a general election, then one will not happen until the end of 24 and early 25. Let's go to the ads. Coming up, how to get some political stability. Dr Parth Patel, Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Public Policy Research, offers his analysis. Why not hit rate and follow in the meantime? Now we're joined by Dr Parth Patel, a Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Public Policy Research. Path, how do you assess the political health of the UK in terms of stability and legitimacy? The ruling political party has two basic functions in our democracy. The first one is to represent. That means to be able to sort of read, understand, aggregate and translate public opinion into coherent policy and a policy offer. And in that context, we've got a bit of a crisis in representation because since the 2019 election, we've seen policy move in a very, very different direction, right? And we, no one really knows what the policy agenda of the day is now. So we've got this, on one hand, we've got this crisis of representation. That's a democratic problem. On the second hand, the second function of the political party of the day is to govern. And in that sense, we've got a crisis in governance as well. We've got the third prime minister coming in in the space of what was about four months. We've seen a bit of helter skelter. We've seen the economic policy rattle global markets, but essentially leaving a scar on everyone else's bills. So we've got this twofold problem, this crisis in representation, this crisis in governance, and that is leading to this crisis in democratic legitimacy. By that measure, the UK doesn't feel like it's in good political health. It doesn't feel like a stable and functioning democracy at this very point. What's your view on the likelihood of an early election? There's two things to consider. First, I think, is the, the moral argument. Should there be a general election. And that, I think, speaks to this point I just made about democratic legitimacy. On those grounds, it's pretty hard to say that we shouldn't have a general election. But that's only one part of the argument. The other side is the tactical argument here and the mechanisms for triggering a general election. And, well, essentially, why would the ruling parliamentary party and the government decide to hold a general election when it is highly likely they will lose a large number of seats if there was to be one? So we're stuck in this slight paradox in terms of while normatively we might think a democratic while a general election is desirable, from a tactical perspective, it doesn't seem to be likely. That doesn't mean it's completely 
it's not going to happen. Someone has to come in and command a majority in the House of Commons. That's no easy task. The Tories have a majority of about, I think, 71 MPs. But even then, this is a party full of factions, some of which look quite different to each other. This is what we're talking about here is quite extraordinary, really. The Conservative British Conservative Party is potentially one of, if not the most successful political party in the world um, over history. And it is imploding. And it's now this really big party with loads of diverse and very different factions. And it's quite hard to hold them together. They're sort of squeezed together by our electoral system, but there are fractures everywhere. How do you assess Labour's chances? It looks likely that Labour will form a government at some point in the next couple of years. The key thing here is that Starmer and Labour's chances are completely contingent on the Tory meltdown. This is broadly a vote against rather than a vote for. And that makes quite a big difference. It means that there's a good chance that we do see a Labour government, whether it's a Labour majority, a Labour minority, a coalition government, I think it's way too early to say what that looks like. But there's a good chance the Tories will be out of power at the next general election. But there's a difference between winning one election, coming in and going back out, which is a very reasonable path that might happen. And something like Starmer being able to form a legacy, trying to create a multi-term government, as he said he would like to do. And to do that, he needs to get voters to vote for him and the Labour Party rather than voting against the Conservative Party. And we're not quite at that stage yet, I don't think. Is there anyone you'd consider a Tory unity candidate? That's an interesting question. I don't think that that unity candidate is obvious. I mean, a Boris Johnson comeback would be extraordinary, but he is toxic. First of all, he divides the commons. He has a lot of strong supporters, but he has a lot of strong dislikers. Moreover, he is very divisive across the country. We have to remember his polling ratings, I think in the summer of this year, were pretty terrible, I think close to minus 40, minus 45 points. Sunak similarly is a divisive character. For lots of people, he looks appealing and he will almost certainly be on the ballot on Monday as one of the final two, if we get to more than one candidate. And lots of people will support him, people that are scared of trustonomics and want stability, people that supported him in the first place, people that think he's probably the best bet ahead of the next general election to stop something catastrophic happening electorally. But again, he's got his dislikers. Penny Morden, I think, is probably the most likely to fulfil this person of maybe can just hold together these different factions within the party, partly because she's less well-known than Sunak and Johnson, has less of a brand associated with her. How do you assess the damage to the country's international reputation done by these weeks of political turmoil? There's probably no two ways about it. It certainly tarnished our reputation on the global stage, whether that's with other countries. I've got colleagues in the US and in Germany who've been texting me saying, what is going on? On the other side, I mean, global markets aren't going to forget what's happened. You know, economic credibility takes a long time to build up it could be shattered overnight. And we're back in that process of a long time to be able to build it back up. So this sort of reputational damage that we've seen over the past, we could say past 45 days, but actually the turmoil's going on a bit longer than that. It's going to be a long road to renewal. And that's not going to be an easy task for Britain in the world. There's more on this story in the Evening Standard newspaper and online at standard.co.uk. That's The Leader. We're back on Monday at 4pm.